I'm going to do a little morning do this morning. I think it's a good song to uh, kind of begin with, even, to get that Grateful Dead feel. It's got a pretty basic structure to it. You can do a nice uh, campfire dead, if you will, uh, just hang around with an acoustic playing the basic chord structure. But the deeper you go and the more you study the song, you really begin to see how much there really is packed into it. And it's a good opportunity and a good, uh, good occasion to discover some distinctive Grateful Dead elements in their, in their music. Uh, and because it's relatively slow paced, uh, you, can, you can keep track. So let me start with just the basic, the basic chord structure, uh, which, which will be important uh, to lay out that first for reasons I'll explain. So just pretty simple, simple progression, really, of, I like to think of it really as a dialogue. Each verse uh, has two lines. Think of the first two lines as uttered by one person, and the second two lines as a reply from somebody else. So the first two lines are D, C, G, back to D. And then the second two lines are F, C, E minor, D. So just let me do a slow uh, strumming pattern just to give you a bit of the feel. So it's really got that, that basic structure throughout the whole, the whole song. Now I intentionally just did that simple strumming to really bring out something that's important, which is how long they pause on the D. Each, each line returns back to the D and they hang out there for a decent bit of time before they uh, continue either a new verse or this, uh, the next line. And that's going to be an important place, important thing to deal with. Now, lots of bands, your, your typical rock band, would have a rhythm guitar is basically strumming those chords throughout and then have a lead player doing stuff on top of it. And I, at least as I see it, I think the dead kind of fell into that in the later, in the later years where there was a lot of just playing of the chords and Jerry soloing on top of, top of the chord progression. What made the later versions often so powerful and such a fan favorite, I think, really was uh, just his heartfelt singing, as well as the intensity of the solo and the crescendo that would build and build and build. Uh, speaking of that crescendo and that last part, uh, though the verses go in the, the way I described it, the way the song ends with the repeating of the line, I guess it doesn't matter anyway. That's just a repeating of the F. So that, that's the part that continues the way the, the, way the song works at the end, uh, ultimately to the final uh, bellowing of, you know, guess it doesn't matter anyway where you can get the powerful. But what's different about the late versions from the earlier versions is I think the earlier versions took many more risks. 
And that's the, that's the one I'm, I'm interested in. So the stuff that I'll try to show you next really is based on some of the earlier versions, say in the early, early 70s, especially around 73 and 74, where I think the versions get really interesting. Part of what makes them interesting is at all, often there's hardly anybody who's actually playing a chord. There's very little actual playing of chords. Instead, what you've got are Garcia playing essentially leaves or single lines. Weir's doing that as well. Not playing a lot of chords, playing a lot of single lines and doing a good bit of noodling around himself. Then Phil is doing his typical bouncing all over the place. And the keys as well are tracing out lots of interesting single lines. So you've got all these threads that wind back and forth. And it makes the song a bit riskier, and there are versions where it feels like it, the whole thing's going to fall apart because they're, they're each doing their independent lines, and there's no, or not much, organizing or foundation or center given by the chords. I think they played it safer in later years with a more traditional strumming of the chords to set up the song with the soloing on top of it. But it's because of the earlier stuff is a little bit more risky, and musically interesting that I want to explore. All right, so the first thing we'll do then is talk about the opening riff. Now the opening riff really has two parts. It has uh, the recognizable start, and then it's got a second half, and that second half shows up again and again. So the opening riff goes like this. The song actually starts with a D. And in some versions, it's just a plain old strumming of a D. Uh, in other versions, it's a much heavier focus on the low notes. Uh, so, and some, Phil comes in really and kind of rattles the walls with, with a very deep, powerful uh, D. But on the guitar, that's about as deep as you can get. All right, so then we got the D chord, then we start on the A. Then F. So that's what I call the first part. And then here's the second part. So in that second part, uh, G A, sorry, A G A, D C D, G A C, and that second part is something we're going to hear again and again. Now, one thing that's important is to recognize the different places on the neck that you can play that what I'm calling the second part. Jerry likes to move it up here to the 5th fret, and a lot of action is going to happen in the 5th, in the 7th the fret region, as well as up at the 7th, up, uh, say, to the 10th. No. do it up even higher. So here's our G and A. So my point of stressing that is, is a way of dealing with that long pause on the D that we mentioned before. So very often what you'll get is a little bit faster. So that little riff, the second part of the opening riff, will be played by Jerry Offen up at the fifth fret. Sometimes he'll move it all the way up to uh, the eighth and the tenth. And sometimes it's actually Bobby that's playing the high version, 
you know, the two octaves up. And sometimes it's Jerry that's doing it. And that can actually make it hard in some of the earlier versions to figure out whose line is who. And because they're both playing these sort of winding single line threads, soloing if you will. And it's hard sometimes to keep track of which guitar is which, especially uh, during certain periods of the sound when both guitars were sounding fairly similar. All right, so there's, there's an important part. Now, as I said, there's all that long pausing and staying on the D. And that's where there's an opportunity for some interesting stuff to be done. Now, I think the key to really getting into the more sophisticated stuff beyond just campfire dead, as I called it, is recognizing that the song is based around D mixolydian. So let me explain that briefly and then show you how that factors in and can, can be put to use. So the D mixolydian scale, it's just a modification of D major scale. So the D major scale, D, E, F sharp, G, A, uh, B, C sharp, D is the D major. The D mixolydian simply drops that seventh and flattens it. So we end up with... Now, if you think about the notes that are just played, those notes of the D mixolydian are the same notes found in the G major scale. And the way that I, as I've tried to explain in other videos is, mixolydian is fifth in the order of the different modes. So you ask yourself, what major scale would have D as its fifth? And the answer is G. So here, if we're in G, there's our one. The D is our five. So the same notes as in the G major. Now that's going to come in really handy. What you should think about doing is playing the G, G major scale, but think about what it looks like at the fifth fret. A, B, C, D, E, F sharp, G, A, B, C, D, E, F sharp, G, A, B, C. Sorry. All right, so there's one place. Now, a second place where you want to think about the G is the G that you can form at the seventh fret here. Really, it's the D shape, but up at the seventh fret. And once you've got that G shape, sorry, D shape G at the seventh fret, just think about the scale that goes with it, the G major scale. So between that and the one up here, you've got the places where Bobby's going to essentially be doing lots of his noodling. Uh, at the times between lines when they're hanging on the D, but also through the chord progressions, uh, especially as I said in the earlier versions. So just playing around in those areas is going to give you morning dew type sounding riffs. Here's a little step down that he uses uh, in the lead up to the verses, just a little, so partial, sorry, the one and the three on the D, one and the, sorry, one and the three on the D, the one and the three on the C, then do the one and the five on the G to get you that D back in there, and then you're back to the verse something that you'll hear often as a way of starting the song. Very much. Now one of the things that 
Jerry very much likes to do, and this is one of the reasons why this is a good introductory song to the dead is, he often likes to have a, either an ascending or a descending line that gets him to the next chord. So to get back to the D, he will often uh, use something like this. After we get to... So that second part of the riff that gets repeated. Back to the D. Now when he moves to the F chord, he steps up and here's a little Jerry type step that he uses. Use the open D and then go to the C. That's another one that you can think about or should think about playing at different, being able to play at different places on the neck, such as or uh, even higher. Let's see. So ways to walk up to the F chord are important. this song. A crucial part of this song is what people refer to as the walk-up. Uh, it's before the first lead break after one of the verses. Now, there's, I know there's, there's debate and some uh, confusion about what's going on. I think the way to understand what Jerry's doing is, though when he plays it, he starts low and works his way up the neck. When you think about the notes he's playing, He's really just playing the notes out of what I said before, the D mixolydian scale, with this exception. He skips the B. He leaves the B out. And we're going to have a back and forth between the A and the C. And then once he gets to the C, he's going to walk up from the C all the way up to the D. So let me show you what I mean. So imagine we play the verse. Then here comes the walk up. That would be the B, so we're going to leave that out. So it's really just the notes of the D mixolydian. So we end, we skip the B, we end up at the C. We do that little back and forth between the C and the A. And then walk up on a little chromatic C, C sharp, D. And then we just repeat it again. C. So there's our A and our C. Now people often accuse Jerry of making mistakes. And if you listen to nearly every version, there comes a moment in it when it sounds like something has gone wrong. And people blame it on Jerry, saying, oh, it's one of those places where he's just too messed up and misses notes. But what I think is really going on is that at the same time he's doing that ascending lick, Phil suddenly comes in very loudly and is doing a descending riff. Now he's doing a descending riff at the same time Jerry is doing an ascending riff. And Phil's descending riff actually has a B in it. So we got Jerry playing a line that doesn't have a B, Phil playing a line that does have a B, and I think it's at that precise moment where they overlap that you get that tension, that kind of clunker sound that people blame on Jerry, but I really think it's intentional dissonance. The ending line really is. So I think it, 
it's D, C, B, G, A, sorry, A, then that same chromatic step up from the C, A, C, A, C, so again, So what Weir's doing down, during that part, if anything, I think he's mirroring what Phil's doing. So you can do little uh, partial chords. So the one and the three on the D. That's Bobby's part. But when I look at videos of them playing, I've often seen Bobby basically just not doing anything until that last part. Then he comes in, and he, sometimes he comes in with full chords, or at least. Phil is so loud, and at this point the keyboard comes in so loud that it's often hard to even tell if Bobby's playing, and I think we basically don't even miss it at the times when he's not. So what's really going on is Phil's playing very loudly this descending line, Jerry's playing the ascending line, and at that moment when Phil's playing the B and Jerry's not is when you get that dissonance. But I think it's intentional and not a mistake. All right, so once that happens, then they move right to the lead. So let me say now a few things in closing about the lead that gets played. Now, when it comes to soloing, I think the mistake that people are inclined to make is, as I mentioned in another video that I did, is just to think of Jerry as hunkering down in one solo, sorry, one scale or mode, and maybe moving up and down the neck, but still staying in one mode. I don't think he's doing that in this song. In some songs, he does. I think in the solo in this song, what he's really doing is he's playing through the changes. So when the chords are moving through the D, C, and G, he's essentially soloing around the D chord and then making some solos around based off of the C chord, the G chord. When it moves up to the F, he's making moves along around the F chord. Then the C. And then the E. So he's playing with the he's playing through the changes, and sometimes what he does, especially at the end when they're repeating the F C E minor D over and over again, is he tends to just engage in some really high fast strumming through those changes. So try to avoid the temptation of just looking for a single scale and work on playing through the changes. It's hard to do because you got to keep the rhythm track, the rhythm straight, and uh, you got to keep keep up with the changes and try to do something that's interesting as well. And I've suggested the way to start is think about arpeggiating the chords, playing around with just the arpeggios till you get your confidence in the timing, and then you can start doing more elaborate stuff. All right, so I hope that's of some help.